Good afternoon. It's uh, wonderful to be back at what is, I understand, the 25th summer school uh, that is being held at IASC in Cusick. And it's a delight that uh, all of you are able to share this occasion. I'm only sorry that I can't be there in person. We're at a remarkable moment in history. A pandemic has locked down two thirds of the population of the world. And we all expect that following this, we will see the largest economic crisis since the Great Depression. So let's talk about how we got into this situation, where we are, and how we need to get out of it. I've titled this presentation, The Future We Want and Our Children Deserve. And I hope that I'll be able to do justice to that proposition. We are in a truly precarious situation at this point in time, probably the most precarious since the Second World War. As we look forward in respect of the developments that we anticipate, there are actually eight drivers of what we believe are the scenarios for future development. The first, right in the middle, and I'm going to go right around the circle from there, is a shifting center of economic gravity as the rise of Asia moves the center of gravity from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The second is a weakening of US power projection, in part due to rising powers in the Pacific and in part due to a lack of will on the part of the United States population to project power. That is contributing to disruption of the rules-based international order, according to which we've run the world for about three decades. We're seeing geopolitical tensions and rising contestation of regional security landscapes. We're seeing system-wide stresses due to the impacts of a growing human population urbanizing increasingly on the Earth system in which we're embedded. All of these factors are increasing social disruption and weakening national governance. And those trends are exacerbated by what is often called the first biodigital technological revolution although many of you will know it by its more familiar title, the Fourth Industrial Revolution. We see three scenarios for the next 10 years. One called islands in which the world splits into US-based and Chinese-based blocks. A second called constructive equilibrium in which the major powers and middle powers agree on how best to manage the challenges that we face. And the third called archipelagos, which may arise if there is a significant standoff between Beijing and Washington and the European Union is called upon to play a bridging role together with other middle powers. Now let's look at exactly where we are. The COVID-19 pandemic, which arises of course from a virus which is designated SARS-CoV-2, is overburdening governments and putting exceptional pressure on central banks and international financial institutions with the IMF and the World Bank in the lead. It's causing corporate liquidations on a remarkable scale and exposing the fragility of balance sheets of all companies. It's inducing psychological and social stress in most communities and bringing financial hardship to many. And it's sparking a storm of information and disinformation through both traditional media and especially social media. And as I've said already, it's threatening a depression of a scale that we haven't seen since World War II. The International Monetary Fund's projections in its economic outlook released on the 14th of April 2020 suggest that we will see negative growth in the world at large of minus 3% in 2020 with the advanced economies contracting by 
and the emerging market and developing economies contracting by 1%. That has never happened since the 1930s. So we stand on the brink. The precipice is below us. We can only manage our way out of this crisis if we collaborate effectively and develop a clear sense of what collective action is necessary to deal both with the pandemic itself and the economic consequences. So let's unpack that. The real problem is we're not half as smart as we think we are. The chap on the left-hand side of that, the picture, is a fellow called Herbert Simon who got the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1978. In 1957, he introduced a very important concept that of what he called bounded rationality. And I'm going to read the quote to you. The capacity of the human mind for formulating and solving complex problems is very small compared with the size of the problem whose solution is required for objectively rational behavior in the real world, or even <clears throat> for a reasonable approximation to such objective rationality. Now that's a little bit scary because we need rationality, we need collective action, we need international cooperation to get out of the disastrous situation in which we presently are. And we can only understand what's required if we look back. I'm going to deal with two portions of the path associated with this. You're looking at dancing with uncertainty, and that is intrinsic in the environment in which we're dealing at the moment. My trigger for all of this is the implosion of the Soviet Union in 1991. I know that in many ways you're looking at 1989 as the beginning of that process, but the decisive moment in global terms is 1991. Remarkably, what happened at that point in time was because the Soviet model was no longer available as an alternative frame of reference, the so-called liberal rules-based international order premised on the United Nations, the Bretton Woods institutions, specifically the World Bank Group and the IMF, and the World Trade Organization became the primary reference points for the organization of international trade, international capital flows, human movement, and the national economic structures of most of the countries in transition having been part of the Soviet bloc, the Warsaw Pact, and uh, the economic sphere defined by the Soviet Union before that. Accepting this new order opened national economic borders to free flows of good, capital, and people. People could travel, they could engage in tourism, they could engage in legal immigration. It led to a flood of economic opportunity. And that's often summarized in what we describe as globalization and what Tom Friedman, of course, called a flat world. China's progressive integration into this order saw about 2 billion people lifted from abject poverty into at least some degree of participation in the modern global economy. Those were positives but there were some negatives inevitably as well. The liberalization of capital flows led to offshore investment in emerging markets by major companies in the United States and other advanced economies. And that inevitably cost jobs for less skilled workers in the United States. It also enabled tax arbitrage by multinational companies who were able to set up in a variety of different jurisdictions and declare large amounts of their revenue, in some cases, all of it in tax havens that deprived governments of revenue that was ne were necessary in order to achieve social advances. These circumstances <clears throat> gave rise to the Asian financial crisis in 1997. And at the height of that crisis, the ratios of debt to gross domestic product in the Asian countries in crisis were as high as 
That was followed almost immediately by the Russian and then emerging markets financial crisis of 1998, where inflation in Russia reached 84%. In the midst of all of that panic, the money that had flowed to emerging markets, to the Pacific in particular, and to some degree, other emerging markets from Brazil and Argentina through South Africa and Turkey out to Russia, that capital shot back in a so-called flight to safety, back into the major capital markets in Washington, London, and to a certain degree, Paris, Frankfurt, and Zurich. The path from 1999 was less simple. First of all, the globalization of Western media through things like CNN and BBC and Sky, and the globalization of Western advertising and entertainment had triggered resentment <clears throat> in many parts of the developing world, and it was seized on in parts of the Muslim Ummah to justify jihad. This is the origin of the Islamist and jihadist movements that we have had to deal with over the course of the past 25 years. At the same time, the dot-com bubble burst in 2000 in the United States. In order to accommodate this extraordinary volume of capital that was flowing back from the emerging markets back into New York and London and other advanced economies, we'd had to invent new notions of how value was created in companies. Revenue was no longer a measure. Profitability was no longer a measure. Anything that had a dot-com on the back end of its name was perceived to operate by the rules of the new economy. Well, of course, they didn't. And the crash was quite inevitable. In order to deal with the effects of that crash, the US Federal Reserve drove interest rates down to low levels not seen in recent times and tried to pump liquidity into the economy. 9-11 occurred just one year later in 2001, and the Fed immediately in response to that lowered interest rates yet again and pumped more liquidity into the economy. In parallel with all of that, <clears throat> we'd seen a liberalization of financial regulation over the latter part of the 1990s, We'd seen hedging and derivative instruments being introduced by merchant and investment banks. <clears throat> if you glance at the illustration on the left-hand side, you'll see the difference between balance sheet assets, the blue line, equity, the green line, and then these remarkable off-balance sheet derivatives in the red line. The financial economy was completely disengaging from the real economy. The central bank stimuli to offset the political and macroeconomic shocks, the quantitative easing that was undertaken, encouraged higher leverage and increased corporate and sovereign vulnerabilities, as well as extremely volatile flows of, port of portfolio capital in and out of the capital markets of the emerging economies. It was no great surprise that therefore we went into another global financial crisis in 2008 which had its origins in the subprime crisis in the United States just one year earlier. So where were we before the pandemic hit us? In October 2019, I had to do a report on global trends for 2030. The reference, if you, anyone wishes to read it, is at the bottom under the word source global trends 2030 highlights. And this was an extract from the highlights. Six years after the end of the global recession, the global economy will see growth of 3% in 2019, the lowest since 2008-9. Despite a strong recovery in capital markets, fiscal and corporate over-indebtedness, low and negative interest rates, slowing manufacturing activity and global trade, higher tariffs and policy uncertainty, and slowing investment pose vulnerabilities throughout the system. A highly disruptive global recession will follow within a few years. 
The point I'm making here is it didn't require the pandemic to bring on the recession. The pandemic has accelerated it and the pandemic has deepened the depression that will follow. But the underlying weaknesses were already present in the economy because of what we had seen earlier. There's only one other factor that I want to draw into this equation. We are pushing up against nine planetary boundaries. There are two rather splendid articles in Nature and Science, respectively, identifying the work that has been done by the Stockholm Research Institute in this regard. These are the planetary boundaries. The reason why we're pushing up against them is because we are 7.8 billion people increasingly wealthy, increasingly urbanized, consuming too much, and as a consequence, manufacturing more than we need, wasting too much and polluting. As a consequence of all of those factors, we are pushing up against these planetary boundaries. And apart from their implications in respect to the present pandemic, we are going to have to deal with them radically and dramatically in the course of the next 10 years. So to do that, we have to use this crisis, which is going to require roughly 10 to $15 trillion to be pumped in to get us out of the depression into which we're being thrown at present. We must use that money not to rebuild a world that has been shown to be seriously flawed in multiple ways but to envision a new future defined by equity, by which I mean fairness, not equality. Equality is a utopian dream, but equity, fairness, justice, decency is not. A future defined by equity, sustainability, and human security. If we cannot ensure that we have a reasonable distribution of income and wealth across society, if we cannot ensure that the vast majority of the inhabitants of any country feel that the system works in a manner that is fair to them, and if we cannot find ways of living in such a way that we do not threaten our survival as a consequence of the planetary boundaries up against we're pushing, we will not succeed. So envisioning that future, defining the pathways to achieving it, and using the funds that will have to be printed and monetized to escape from the depression in order to create an equitable, secure, and sustainable world is the task of our age. It's conceptually simple. It's only got three pillars, equity, sustainability, and security. But it will be challenging to execute in a fractured world. If we tackle it sensibly, however, the G20 can take the lead in driving this forward. And developing a new system premised on those three pillars can become the template for the Italian G20 presidency in 2021. There are a few very simple practical steps. With the support of the Sherpas, the so-called engagement groups within the G20, Business 20, Civil Society 20, uh, Leadership 20, Science 20, Think Tanks 20, uh, Women 20, Youth 20, Urban 20, can work together to propose how to integrate equity, security, and sustainability into a new system design and embed it in both national and international instruments. The ministerial groups who have numerous consultations before the summit at the end of each year, running across agriculture, climate and environment, development, the digital economy, education, employment, empowerment, energy, finance, health, infrastructure, tourism, trade and investment, and water, can all consider how to embed those three principles, equity, security, and sustainability, as organizing principles into each of their ministerial portfolios. The foreign ministers who meet before the summit could draft a communique for the heads of state and government, 
indicating how we will create a sustainable, equitable, secure world going forward. And this would allow the G20 in summit to adopt it at the summit of the heads of state and government and to agree on a new order that's fit for purpose in the third decade of the 21st century. As we probably won't complete this task in one year, it can also introduce a degree of coherence into the agendas of the presidencies of the G20 and thus allow the 20 largest economies in the world representative of all parts of the global space and representing more than 80% of economic activity to play a constructive role in creating a world that is fit for purpose at present and an appropriate inheritance for our children. Thank you very much.